Hey, everybody. Welcome to Prop Live, our weekly prop and costume making Q&A show. And uh, this week, we've got ourselves a guest all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to jump right to him. It's Harrison Cricks from Vulpin Props. How's it going? Hi, everybody. I'm Harrison Cricks from Vulpin Props, like, like Bill already said. That's right. And Harrison has strategically hidden all the projects he's currently working on right right now because none of us all over there. If you if I turn the camera like ninety degrees, I I I lawsuit. I have a bunch of lawyers angry at me, (laughs) so I will not do that. Uh, cool, man. Your your shop's looking tidy. Uh, someone must have done a really good job sweeping a few weeks ago. Uh, really? Do you want me to point the uh, a few (laughs) weeks ago? Does the shop on your floor stay clean for four weeks? No, it does not. Was it, has it really been? It has been four weeks. Yeah, it's been four weeks. If you want, I can point the webcam at the floor and show you. But no, it's all right. Yeah, no, it's not so not so clean. No, it was, no. It was very clean because Bill did his his annual traditional, apparently traditional now that he sent it two years in a row, yep. swept the shop floor. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's because I was down there for Dragon Con. Um, I, and I don't know about you, but Dragon Con for me was a lot of fun this year. I just had a pretty good time oh this was yeah i had a fantastic dragon con um it was a little bit on the dull side for me because i didn't have a new costume for myself which is a bit of a bummer um and i you know everybody likes bringing out their new stuff um but uh, i didn't have one which eh, you know that that kind of had me a bit like grouchy going into the con but actually at the con was a really good time so I had a- oh yeah and i'll tell you what too i had a new costume i had my um uh, destiny shacks armor and that was really fun, but you know what? I'm just at the point that wearing that carpet thing and just hanging out yeah. was super fun. Just taking it easy, not yeah, I, off. We need to come up with another good, like, just, you know, goof off from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. comfortable kind of costume for next year. Yeah. I had one. I had, got it. No, what we're going to do, Um, we had this idea. You and I chatted about it. We're going to take all of our company shirts, right? Vulpin props, Punish props, Solo Roboto, SKS props, all of us, um, Jarman props, Impact props, we'll throw them all in a bag, right? And then we each get to pull it out and we each get to wear each other's shirt. We have to pretend to be that person for the rest yeah. of the night. <laughs> this is a fantastic idea. I think so. Evil FX, um, God, who am I? You know, I'm going to forget one person and I'm going to be pissed off. That's right. Story right. props, uh, yeah, I can keep going. If that, I have you're not actually my friend. <laughs> that would be really fun. You're right, though. It, for me, the, the Dragon Con this year was all about uh, just taking it easy and enjoying myself. And yeah. not – like, I've had those years where I'll just wear my costume for, like, 12 hours straight. And the next morning, I'm like, why did I do that? That was so stupid. I'm sore. I'm yeah. dehydrated. I hate myself. Well, I think next year is going to be a year for me to do that because the last two years have been kind of casual for me. Like I made Skyrim, that was three years ago, actually four years ago. Um, yeah, four, wow, four years ago. Yeah. I'm never bringing Skyrim out again. Never. Nope. Like, that oh. thing is on the mannequin and it is there forever um, because it's uncomfortable, it's heavy, it's hot, it takes an hour and a half to put on. I have to paint my face with all kinds of makeup and stuff and it's never, never again. Forever and ever, amen. So the next thing I'm going to be doing is um, plans for next year are Templar armor from Dragon Age and uh, Link from Twilight Princess because I've wanted to redo that for years. So this year is going to be the year. Cool. That sounds pretty fantastic. Uh, you also had your transistors, or you didn't have it. Emily, your wife, had your transistor sword there. That thing was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, I uh, <laughs> made two of them. Woo! Uh, got it done just before Dragon Con. Um, uh, and uh, it, it weathered the con fairly well for something that's that large and that fragile. Right. Uh, and the battery life was great. It was a huge hit. You know, it's a big glowing thing, so everybody loves it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that went really well. Um, the guys at Supergiant Games love theirs, which is also a plus. And uh, I actually have a third one on the books right now, um, which I almost never do, uh, repeat projects. I, I, I try to sh- like shy away from those as much as possible. But I got a really touching email um, from this girl who said the transistor had meant a lot to her, really changed her life, and, and uh, she also had a very uh, uh, ample budget. There you uh, go. That so helps. She initially was like, uh, you know, interested in buying the one that I had already, and I was like, no, that's my wife's, and you'll have to pry it out of her cold dead hands. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, I'm I'm starting on a third one here in a couple of weeks. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you put up a video, uh, Brit. 
put a link here. We'll have it in the description uh, of the transistor short. It's probably the video of uh, Louis barking at it, I think. Yep. <laughs> Hello. Hey, buddy, you want to say hi? Oh, it's Louis, the shop dog. Louis, Louis come here. Come here. Louis, come here. Speak. Louis, speak. Good boy. Speak. Yay. Ooh, All right. <laughs> screw, you. screw you, people with headphones. Go That's go. right. No, you can stop now. That's all we need. Cool. Well, that was awesome. I'm glad I got to check it out uh, firsthand. And uh, especially if people are, uh, I gotta, we'll do a little plug for you here. Uh, over at vulpinprops.com. Hey, um, what was that? I said, hey, my broken website. Yay. Hey, it's it's working. It functions. It needs it, a lot of updates. It's, yeah. It's doing its thing. Mine does too. If folks are, are re really interested in uh, how Harrison's building all that stuff, you've got your blog with all of your, well, not all of your write-ups currently, <laughs> but I, a lot of write-ups on there. Uh, and, I'm, I'm missing about seven right now. Yeah. Uh, but also uh, uh, your weathering and painting book is over there too. Which yes. Which is totally worth it. Folks should I, go grab that. I think it is. Um, I, think it's, I think it's one of the best painting books I've ever written. That, <laughs> that's a fact. That is, yeah, that's a that's a jacket quote right there. <laughs> I think you do quote yourself in the book, don't you? Well, I think I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm not entirely certain, but I think that my quote of myself is a quote I stole from Adam Savage. I'm not. I think it is, but my memory good. sucks, so I don't even know if I was if I was properly quoting me or if I was plagiarizing myself, plagiarizing someone else. Uh, the other thing, before we uh, start taking uh, questions here, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the old uh, X-Carve machine, the CNC router that you use a lot on that transistor sword, because cool. I just put mine together. I will give you guys a little Whoa. save her vomit cam. There is my X-Carve right here. Yay! So it's... Um, it's rough, actually. It's gone through a lot. This machine. Um, yeah. The uh, the spoil board on it is spoiled. It's uh, it's very cut up, very very gouged. Um, and uh, I've I've learned a lot about CNC machining, uh, a lot of what not to do. But I've finally gotten to the point where this thing will turn out consistent results. Um, and so I'm really happy to have it here. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm gonna have a video on mine up tomorrow, so folks can look forward to that. And then I'll be learning a lot on how to use mine too. I have a piece here, the thing I did this morning and ruined, uh, but it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> Trying to see if I've got. Oh yeah, here, here's some some things that I've carved out. So this was the. Um, these have all been primed already. This is the cross guard for the transistor, which looks pretty simple if you just look look at it from this direction. But if you kind of look down there, it's got this weird geometry where this curves up and then also back down at the sides. It's got these weird little cutouts here. Um, so the CNC did a really good job of that. Also, this is a piece uh, out of some tooling board that would be way too big to make on my lathe, and it's also hollow, which would be difficult. So the CNC spat this out really quickly. Um, oh, yeah. I've actually got two uh, employees right now. One uh, comes down every weekend, and then my other guy, uh, Adam, comes in twice a week. And they're both really well versed in 3D modeling. So they spit out the models for me, and uh, we cut them on the machine. That is mighty handy. Yeah. Uh, the, I'm really stoked about it, too, because it's um, a lot of the tools that, that would have been more industrial level and industrial priced, you know, a decade or two ago, yeah. are now well within reach of uh, serious hobbyists or um, young, or not young, but small business type people like us. Oh, well, yeah, and, and sort of up and coming. I mean, that thing... It's not as though it's it's cheap. I think the ones that you and I got, we optioned out everything on it, and they come to around fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. But um, the the acceleration in the build process is phenomenal. I wish I wish I could show you what I've been doing for this NDA thing, um, because it's it's it spent a lot of time on the um, the CNC, but uh, I can't <laughs> show you. I've been recording a lot of it actually, because I'm planning on putting up a, a full um, like recap video when it's all said and done. Cool. But um, the other thing that's really nice about it, and I know you have a similar laser cutter to what I've got, but uh, for instance, stuff like for the transistor. So this is a uh, one eighth inch uh, Sintra, right? It's a big sheet of this stuff, and none of this would have fit on my laser cutter. Plus, you can't laser cut Sintra anyway. But the X card does it really, really well, and a part like this doesn't take any time at all. 
So this was all of, you can see the transistor shapes in here, but that's all the little accent pieces that stuck on top. Sintra is fantastic on those machines. Oh, yes. Uh, did you get a chance to check out the Glowforge laser cutter yet? At least no, videos? I, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. I, I haven't taken a look at it just because I'm not in the market for it. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, the, the uh, full spectrum one that I've got works pretty well. Um, you know, when... And I tweaked the hell out of that machine. It's not it's not the machine that full spectrum full spectrum sent me, um, but I've got it working. It it you know it slots into my workflow and I'm fine with it. So, what I was interested in was the uh, Form One Plus or the Form Labs Form Two. I'm not sure the proper name for it, but the new um, uh, resin 3D printer that came out. I think that's going to be my next big purchase. Yeah, that's cool. Like all this stuff too, and. And again, like that that new Glowforge thing, I think the base model is like two grand, which again, not cheap, but for what you're getting, it you get a lot of bang for your buck. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I've wanted to upgrade. I think after I get the 3D printer, I'll, I'll be upgrading my laser cutter because I've had that same one now for uh, coming up on five years, um, and it's been a fantastic machine. And you know, I've gotten it to do all kinds of crazy stuff, um, a lot of stuff it wasn't really designed for. Um, but I kind of reached the limits of what it can do for me, and I'd like something that's just Larger and more powerful. You know, if I had my my choice, I'd get yours, which is the the much bigger bed size with the uh, more powerful laser. Um, I don't know. Like, I'm also a little apprehensive because things are moving so quickly. Like, maybe in two years, uh, you know, a machine bigger and more powerful than the one that you've got will only be fifteen hundred dollars. You know, yeah, who knows? dropping in price and moving so quickly. Yeah, totally. But I will say too, like from some, my previous hobby was photography and <laughs> anyone who gets into buying lenses and camera knows like dropping two grand on a, a laser is cheap compared to a lens that costs, you know, twice that. <laughs> well, I mean, you can, you can always go bonkers, but you can also go budget too. Like I've got my, my spray booth, which has a bunch of ND, NDA stuff in it, so I can't show you. Um, but I built that from scratch myself, and uh, all the materials together all totaled about $2,200. And I could have just turnkey bought one. Uh, there's a company up in New Hampshire, I think, that sells kits, and that would have been like $4,800. So, yeah. you know, this one does what I need. Same with the back former. You know, it's what you absolutely need to get by. And I'm, I don't know if it's like that in photography as well, but uh, there's two photographers I know really well. Dan uh, Almse, who, who are, uh, photographs a lot of my stuff. He says one of his favorite cam, uh, like can, uh, sorry, Canon lenses is this like, I think it's a hundred and twelve dollar thirty five millimeter lens, and it's yep. all plastic, and they're basically disposable. So he's like, it shoots great, and then when you screw it up, you throw it away and you buy another one. <laughs> For sure, cool. All right, uh, how do you feel about taking some questions? I how to make props? I feel fine. Uh, great. Sure. Because we got a bunch of them. People sent us a whole crap ton earlier today. Cool. We're going to start with one from Kat. Kat, and this one's perfect for you. What resin dyes or colorants do you use for your resin? And how do you prevent air bubbles? For example, say one of your curse trophies. Actually, I have one of those right here. I got two of those. You, mean just so you would have that. <laughs> I actually, I have... I just realized I'm swapping batteries right now because I'm multitasking. My both as I was assembling, what was I putting together? I was fixing something I broke yesterday. I realized that all of my uh, batteries for all my power drills were dead. Yeah, did you go? Like, I've got to buy new drill batteries. Mine will hold the charge for about eight seconds. Yeah. So, dies. Excuse me, I've been drinking beer, so I'm all belchy right now, so dies. So this stuff right here, this is Smoothcast 326, and a lot of people think that you need to use, um, I'm not sure how well in focus that is, a lot of people think that you need to use the uh, the Smoothcast um, Crystal Clear in order to get good, clear castings like this. 326 is a little bit UV sensitive, so you don't want to uh, stick it outside all the time, um, but it can produce some really pretty stuff. Uh, it has a slightly yellowish tint, but as you can see, you can't even tell with this blue dye in here. Um, as far as colors, I use um, Smooth On So Strong. Uh, this is, it's been sanded down, so he's a little matte right now. But you can see this just yellow in here and then kind of a gradient to the orange at the base. Um, the So Strong stuff from Smooth On is really great. Um, they've got a bunch of glowing pigments that are cool, that like glow under black or UV light. Um, and then Smooth On actually has a whole bunch of fillers too. Uh, when I did my um, 
what was it? The uh, curse? No, uh, sorry, the riot trophy, the collegiate championship one. Um, I use some of their granite fillers, which is really neat. That stuff is great. Um, but you have to add in a lot of um, filler so that it doesn't sink all the way to the bottom. Um, and as far as getting rid of bubbles, I use a pressure casting chamber, which is basically an enormous grenade. Um, so you put your mold in a big tub, and then you run air pressure into it, about 50 pounds, uh, 50 PSI. And uh, you need a big compressor to do that. And uh, you leave it in there while it cures. And that, what, what that does, um, it, insofar as physics applies to us with prop makers, uh, liquid cannot be compressed, whereas air can be compressed. Um, so when you pressurize a vessel, it takes all the little air bubbles and it just pushes them down. They're still there, but they're very, very tiny. Um, and then when the resin sets, it holds all those air bubbles down at their really tiniest size. You can't see them anymore, they're microscopic. Um, and that's how you end up with like really nice water clear castings like this that don't have any, you know, funky air bubbles or trap in there. Yes, okay. I think, I think a, a pressure pot is next on my list of things to buy. Yes, uh, if, if I can make a recommendation, um, I bought the cheap little Harbor Freight guy first, it's like 80 bucks or something. Right. Uh, and then later I ended up getting the big grizzly one, um, which Frankie Belito has one of those. Yes. And uh, I would recommend starting with that because um, it is more expensive, but you can fit anything in it. And you'll start to make molds just so they'll fit in that chamber. Here we go. I got a, uh, I got a picture of it right here. And yeah. 160 some odd bucks for something you're going to use a lot is not that bad. Uh, that's two and a half gallons. Yeah, there's a bigger uh, one. Mine's the 11 gallon. <laughs> Never mind. Let me, let me see where that one is. Oh, it's not even on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, the two and a half gallon one. Uh, the two and a half gallon one's about the same size as the Harper Freight guy. Um, here, hang on, just just one second. I'll show you some scale here. All right, I will try and find the bigger one. Grizzly, Grizzly, uh, eleven gallon pressure pot. There we go. That's a different heavy. one. I would lift it up, but it's very very heavy. Ah, yes, that is a much larger pressure pot. So this one is uh, 11 gallons. You need a big compressor to get it to work. But the nice thing is a mold this size will still fit in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually bought that, um, like this thing, specifically for that curse project. And um, I've ended up using it for pretty much everything. So anytime I cast anything now, it goes in there because I don't have to worry about air bubbles. Um, but just in case anybody's curious, if you use a pressure tank for your molds, you have to use a vacuum chamber when making the molds because it'll also collapse the bubbles that are in the silicon. Yes. Which will damage your mold. Good to know. Thank you, Kat, for your question. Uh, this next one comes from Simon. This one's for Harrison. He says that he loved your painting and finishing book. And do you have any plans for more? Yes, I'm, I've got a mold making book actually in the works. Um, it's, I've got like 15 pages of it written in my notebook, which is in here somewhere. I don't know where. Um, and I am actually going to be taking an entire month off coming up soon. Uh, what? Yeah, you know, the entire month of November, I am working on personal projects. Uh, and I, I will probably also be working on that mold making book a little bit as well. Super cool. I'm also working on one right now. It's all going to be in the in the foam smith line of books. But this next one's going to be all about weapons. It should be really fun. Cool. Yeah, and I did a lot of writing while I was traveling to and from uh, the Philippines. Yeah, was... that, that looked like a hell of a con. That really was. I was kind of blown away by the, the turnout and the um, excitement of the attendees there. Yeah. They don't have big conventions at all like that. And the people who put the show on really wanted it to have that uh, New York Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con feel. Cool. So they went overboard with everything. How was attendance? It was uh, packed. It, it was cool. Friday was a little slow. You didn't. We didn't really know what to expect. We're like, I don't know. And then Saturday, I was like, desperate for breathing room. There were so many people in there. That's good. That's that's really good to hear because I hear there's a lot of conventions and it seems like there's a lot a lot of new conventions coming out. And the problem is, you know, you go to year one, there's nobody there, and you're like, ooh, yeah. Well, I I found out that the Manila, the Greater Manila Metro Manila area has about 12 million people in it. Oh, so it's yeah. a small city. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it turns out uh, when people are looking for a bigger convention, because they normally just have like smaller anime conventions, they, yeah. they were ready to go. Cool. 
Alrighty, cool. Thank you for the question, Simon. This next one comes from Noah. He says, I made a foam helmet and I had to do it twice because I didn't allow for the material thickness the first time. Uh, it was too tight. This this happens to the best of us, Noah. Yep. He says, what's a good way to factor this in for the future? That's a question for you. Yeah, I'll take that one. So when I'm building a helmet, I have a head form of my brother because I don't want to, I didn't want to put goo on my face. So I got a life cast of my twin brother. And if I need to worry about the sizing and fit on it, uh, and I did this for my Destiny helmet, I will uh, pad it out a little bit. I'll just wrap like uh, paper like in, or cloth or squishy foam around the head to pad it out and give it a little bit of breathing room. And then I'll wrap uh, foil over that and then tape that up and draw my template right on there. And, and I do believe I have a video of that. I did a live stream where I did that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, that way you give yourself a little bit of room inside that dome. Uh, good luck, Noah. Next one comes from Amir. Uh, oh, Amir just wants to know that he used some of your blueprints and the question vanished. Where'd it go? I don't <laughs> know. He, he said he used your blueprints and they worked out really well. Cool. I need to update those, actually. I haven't uploaded, like, there's so many things I need to put in my store, but the blueprints are, like, at the top of that list because I haven't added new ones in probably a year and a half and any of my projects, and I really need to do that. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, all right, this next one here goes uh, comes from Dan. He wants to know... Um, oh, he's just not really a question. He just wanted to know that we've inspired him over the last two or three years. He's posted pictures of his work on Instagram, and if you could follow me, that would make my day. Cool. cool. I'll put. Uh, it's goodies goods. <laughs> I'll put. A, I'll put that uh, Instagram. Have you seen Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels? Yes. Okay. The first thing I thought about was that that like you know name it like Bobby's Bits or something and. <laughs> build it. I'm sorry, man. That's not a nice thing to say about your Instagram handle. <laughs> Goodies, goods. Here's a here's a uh, a link over there to Dan. He's got oh, there's there's a Goodies destiny goods. knife. Totally not sex toys. <laughs> cool. I see uh, something yeah. from Mad Max over there. Cool stuff, man. Lots of foam. I like it. Uh, this next one here comes from Drake. Uh, oh, he wants to know what primer you you use and what uh, paint gun and airbrush you use. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have four paint guns. I use two different types of primer depending upon what I'm trying to do, and I have four airbrushes depending upon what I'm trying. <laughs> um, so give me just a second because I, I think visuals make things more interesting. Very good. That's what I learned, uh, especially when I was hanging out in Frank's shop, how... Uh, it's like, oh, what airbrush do you use? And Frank's like, I don't know, what day and hour is it? Uh, yeah. what, once what you go down it? that path, you end up with a collection of them. So there's oh. yeah, one of my guns is blown apart because I've been cleaning it. Um, and let's get airbrushes. I've got to move oh, the yeah. box. So hang on one second. Um, I know I have three airbrushes right now, and I have two or three more that I want to get. All right, okay, so primer. So I do everything HVLP now. I, I very rarely um, use rattle cans. So once you get a spray booth, it, it, that, that kind of tends to happen. So the initial primer that I use is this. This is Evercoat Slick Sand. And it, I'm really fortunate that the movie industry has moved into Atlanta because I can get this now at the engineer guy that sells all my mold making stuff. This is a polyester based primer. Uh, so it's very similar to Bondo in the way that it smells. And it's also very similar to polyester resin in the way that it's mixed. So you get a little thin vial of hardener. Man, that is really blown out. Let's try adjusting that. Okay. Um, you get a little thin vial of hardener. It's like one to 100 ratio. This stuff sets up really fast if you get it wrong and it can clog up your gun, but it sprays beautifully, right? So you can sand something down with like 80 grit and there's big sanding marks everywhere. You blast this on top of it, they're all gone. One quick sand pass, you're good to go. So that's my big first stage filler primer. This is what I use after that. This is called MIPA, M-I-P-A. Um, it's an acrylic based primer. Uh, this is a finishing primer, it smooths on very, very smooth. 
or it sprays on very, very smooth. It's a little expensive, um, and the instructions don't come in English, uh, but it's a four to one. Um, sets in about an hour. That's a really nice thing because you can spray it and then just leave it. Uh, and then an hour later, come back, uh, you're ready to sand and paint. This is my primer gun. Uh, I do not know what brand name it is because it is a very, 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 very cheap Chinese knockoff of a nice Devilbus. Um, but it has a really large 2.2 uh, uh, millimeter nozzle on it. So you could spray maple syrup out of this thing and get a really nice spray pattern. Um, I also have one of these cheap little Harbor Freight guys. This has a 1.8 mil tip on it. Um, you can get these on sale at Harbor Freight for about 12 to $15. They're actually not that bad of a gun. Um, spray pattern's a little dotted, um, but for primer, uh, for finer primer like the MEPA, this actually works pretty well. And then this is a, an Iwata WS400. Um, this is not my gun. This is my friend Josh's gun, but he doesn't have a spray booth and he paints here all the time. So he leaves this here. This is a $900 gun. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Josh just leaves it here and I can use it whenever I want. And this thing is just like painting something with silk. Anything you put in it comes out of it beautifully. And every time I use it, I'm like, oh, that's why it's $900. <laughs> This is a great base coating gun. Um, the needle's uh, 1.2. It's a little small for most clear coats, and which is why I use, and this guy's been blown apart. This is a DeVilbis starting line HVLP. This is what I use for all of my clears, gloss and matte. Um, this is actually pretty cheap, inexpensive little gun. Um, it was about, uh, I want to say like $120. You can get them on Amazon sometimes for 100 bucks. Um, so this is what all my clear comes out of, and if I have anything that's a really heavy metallic, I spray with this, it's a 1.6 tip. I have a, a question. When you're doing catalyzed clears, uh, once you're once it's done, what do you do to make sure it never gets clogged? What do you mean? Like, like to clean it, like what sort of uh, solvents and oh. brushes and all that? Okay, well, I've, I've actually just gotten done cleaning my gun, so I've got all the brushes and solvents and all that kind of stuff over here. Um, you know, there's standard airbrush cleaning stuff, this little key ring, oh, yeah. and all these little guys on it. You know, these little things come with every single one of those brushes. Um, you know, I soak all the parts that don't, well, take the whole thing apart, take all the rubber O-rings off so they don't get destroyed. Um, soak all the pieces in lacquer thinner. Um, take scrub brush to everything, toothpicks to everything, tiny little brushes to everything. My my uh, clear coat guns, my color guns, I clear I, I clean every time I use them. Um, the primer guns can go months between cleanings because the nozzles are huge, the channels are huge. It doesn't really matter. You're going to be sanding the primer anyway. Um, as far as cleaner is concerned, I just use a standard lacquer thinner with pretty much everything. Um, that'll dilute urethane, acrylic, polyester. Doesn't matter. Um, I don't spray epoxy, but I know it works with epoxy as well. Cool. Uh, yeah. And then as uh, air, airbrushes for the last thing. So um, for base coating, I have my uh, Badger uh, 200NH, right? This is single action Badger. It works very much like a um, spray paint can. So you just press this button and paint comes out. There's no flow regulation. Uh, this has a really big tip on it. It's a 1.2. So a big spray pattern, you can spray metallics with this, which is really nice. Um, the other piece I have here for base coating, this is a Thayer and Chandler from the late 80s. Um, you can't get these anymore, but I really like it for small detail work. Uh, this has a 0.08 tip on it. Um, I use this for base coating. Uh, I also have an Iwata Eclipse, which is pretty standard HPBCS. Um, this is also another base coating gun. It has a smaller tip than the uh, Badger, but it also is a dual action. So you can control paint flow as well. So if I need large gradients, I use that. And the very last is my little Cadillac that I've got here, my Iwata HPCH, which is my detail gun. One of these is about $450, uh, and it is worth every single penny. This thing does beautiful gradients. Uh, it's really good at very fine work, very nice, tiny detail. Uh, it has a 0.06 mil tip on it, so it gets clogged very quickly with anything that's not uh, very fine paint. There we go. This is great. I love it. I don't have to do any talking this episode. Yeah, that's a lot of friends of mine who have invited me on podcasts and stuff to say that I tend to railroad things. So I apologize that uh, you're not getting a word in edgewise. That's fantastic. I like, I like talking about paint, obviously. I have uh, I wrote a book on it. Uh, so I have a lot of, of opinions about paint. Yes. <laughs> fantastic. Once again, folks, that uh, 
that book, Alvar, on uh, vulpenprops.com. Go, uh, go pick that up. It's written right there. It's Vulpen Props. There we go. <laughs> uh, this next one comes from Motive Props. He says, uh, now that you have the three big tools, laser cutter, 3D printer, and X carver, what would you uh, would you still buy them in the same order or switch it up? Oh, that's that's actually really interesting. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you do have a 3D printer. I don't yet. I do. Um, oh, what would I? I got the laser for you know what? The laser for me was the best first one to get because I build stuff like that anyway, where I cut out two dimensional layers and then glue them together. The laser just kind of replaced a lot of what my scroll saw usually does. <laughs> yeah, my band that it replaced a lot of what my band saw did. Yeah, band saw and scroll saw. Um, so the laser, I think, would still be my first choice. Um, but I'll tell you what, I got a feeling once I start using that X card more and more, I'm probably going to. <sighs> it really depends. They're all so so. Specific would, and versatile. I would say that a laser cutter, um, you know, since it's just an X and Y, provides you with a really good introduction uh, for stuff that is eventually going to have a Z axis to it. Um, and I think that if I were to recommend, and I don't have a 3D printer, but if I were to recommend it to somebody, I would say that the CNC mill should come last in that sequence. Um, because I think the 3D printer is a is a much smarter machine and will forgive you for a lot of mistakes that the CNC won't. Yeah, yeah. I I agree, especially because the CNC is 2.5D technically, right. um, and there are a lot of considerations you have to take. You can't do undercuts. You have to worry about where that spindle is, otherwise the spindle will run into your piece. Yep. Um, How so have you destroyed your clamps yet? No, I haven't. Uh, I came close today. I was watching it. Uh, so far, I'm still in the honeymoon period where whenever I cut something, I stand there and I watch it for like an hour. Yeah, that that stops. Yeah. <laughs> I had like an hour and a half long phone call the other day. I set that thing up. I just left. Yeah. <laughs> I went to get the once while I was cutting parts out. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the the, the laser first is, is probably the best, best bet still. And that's why I didn't. That's why I bought mine about a year ago. Yeah, I would. I would say the laser is a good introductory thing because it teaches you exactly. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm doing work. I'm compulsive. So I'm reassembling my, my paint gun. Um, but the laser teaches you a lot about uh, computer control cutting. Yes. Cool. Thank you, Motive Props, for the question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, next one comes from Garrick. He says, "How does doing commission work for individuals doing them from corporate clients?" Did either of you have to make any changes in your process or workflow? Uh, he's, yeah, he's in the middle of lining up his first corporate commission, and he's looking for words of wisdom. Uh, one thing to um, one thing to that I didn't get until uh, it happened was I was like, "Oh, all done, time to get paid." And they're like, "Well, here's what we have to do: we've got to put you into payroll. We're going to need a W nine from you, and also payroll just happened, so you're not going to get paid for another month." <laughs> Damn it! So keep that in mind. <laughs> if you want to get around that, um, they have contracts. We're business entities. We can have contracts as well. Um, and I have one for whenever I agree to do work for a, 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 you know any sort of corporate client. They send me an agreement and they say this is how I do things. I'm like, okay, here's mine. And um, mine says net thirty. So once I finish, you pay the remaining balance within thirty days. Also half up front, no matter what. Um, uh, you know, additional, uh, I have a, a lot of clauses in there. That's like, um, if you have any alterations, uh, they have to have them between these set periods of time. Um, if there's a rush fee, uh, you know, your project has to be completed, uh, in a, in a narrower time schedule that, that incurs a fee, uh, my NDA stuff. If you, you know, I get all my business through social media. So, um, if you require me to, to clam up and not say anything for a little while, there's a percentage fee based on that. Uh, so absolutely write yourself a contract. That's. Think of this as a business. They are protecting their, themselves by, I would imagine, sending you a contract. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't do the same. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, no, it's fine. They're, you know, a big company. We're just really happy to work for them. That's It's good that we can be excited to work for these companies that we love. But at the same point in time, protect yourself. Uh, make sure you're going to get paid. Um, make sure that every single element is very clearly spelled out. Uh, one of the things that um, is very important is if there's any sort of repairs that need to be done. So you make a prop for a client, 
client takes it on the show floor, they hand it to a booth model, booth model breaks it, they turn back to you and they say, it's broken, fix it. And there's not a clause in there that, that says, you know, hey, repairs are on you, or I have, mine actually reads as though uh, if there's any defects, right? So I give it to you, you turn it on, half the LEDs burn out. Well, that's obviously my fault, and I'll take care of that. Um, but I give it to you, you take it on the floor, somebody stands on it and breaks it in half, well, that's on you, and I'm gonna charge you for it. Um, you know, write all this stuff out. Uh, be, be prepared for their bureaucracy to move very slowly, um, but it's uh, it yeah. It, I would say that the, that's the main difference between a, 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 an individual and a corporate client is that you're working with a machine, yeah, less so than a person. And I will say too, a lot of the the things that you you you're at a point now where you've done a lot of those and you've learned over time. Uh, Garrick here is just going into his first one, and uh, he'll learn. There's a lot of stuff he'll learn just by doing it just by yeah, was, dealing with the machine. The, I remember the first uh, a corporate job I got, I was, I was all starry-eyed about this, and I turned it down. I, and eventually, uh, you know, I went back and I went, this is a bad idea. Uh, Irrational, uh, back in 2009, uh, when Bioshock 2 was uh, in development about to come out, they were gonna do some promotional stuff, and they sent me an email, and they're like, we, we saw your big daddy, we want you to make a Subject Delta. You know, we've got three weeks, um, <laughs> and it needs to be in New York. Uh, and I, you know, I was, I had a, I had a bandsaw, a table router, and a belt sander, and that was it, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I could do this. And I went out in my, like, my tiny half-car garage in the, in the house I used to have like, downtown in Atlanta, and I'm like, I'm gonna start working. And I, I started making like two parts of this, this massive drill arm out of like, you know, ABS and MDF or something. And I got, you know, at the end of the night, it was, you know, I put four hours into it, and then I had like this tiny little puck. I actually still have it. It's somewhere in my scrap bin, because I haven't thrown it away. Um, this tiny little puck with this tiny little hose fitting out of it, and I went, I cannot do this in three weeks. <laughs> you know? And and they're they're offering me money, but that's like it would be very detrimental for me to say yes and damage my career. So I had to come back in the next day and say like, look, you know, I, I really wanted to do this because you guys are amazing, but I gotta I gotta think of what's best for me long term. Um, don't be starry eyed, and I, I, you know I was, so it's hard for me to tell somebody not to. But uh, you know, you, this is um, an industry that we've elevated to celebrity status as fans, right? So if Bioware or Valve or Bethesda or Irrational, Insomniac, Microsoft, I'm listing companies I've worked for because I'm a dick. Um, if they all roll up to you and, and they're like, you know, we want you to build this amazing thing. Here's five hundred dollars we need in a week. You need to be able to go like, that's not, I can't. Like it's flattering, but um, you know. Don't don't cut them breaks because they're a big name. They have more money than private clients. Yeah, mind. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is ah. um, if you do take a job like that and you either finish it poorly, and uh, that's bad for you, or Absolutely. if you don't finish it all, it's bad for you as well. It's better to um, either say no, I can't do it in that in that time. Uh, can you extend the deadline? Which usually they can't. Usually, they or can. to just turn it down. It's better to, yeah, yeah. And that's once you, you know, once you start doing a lot of projects, you're going to start turning clients away, and that's okay. Yes. So, um, I've passed off a lot of jobs this year. A lot of a lot of really great big corporate jobs that I wish I could take on, but it would be very detrimental for me to go like, yeah, I can totally do that, and then either not deliver. Or deliver a product that's not up to my standards. Yep. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say that the biggest difference is companies pay slowly. You're dealing with a, a glacial bureaucracy when it comes to most of them, unless they're a very small developer. Um, and uh, and a lot of people sell themselves short because they they want to get a foot in the door. There you go. Whole bunch of good advice for you there, Garrick. This next one comes from one of our regulars, Old Gamers Rule. He wants to know uh, for Harrison. Like yes, it's a good one. Uh, he's doing an OLED screen for his Lawgiver Mark II gun from Dread, and he's curious if Arduino or Raspberry Pi would be good for that. Probably a Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah. Raspberry Pi is better set up for any sort of graphic interface. Um, I know the big Arduinos, the Arduino Megas, uh, can can run that, but once you get into something with that level of complexity, I'm you know a Raspberry Pi is probably overkill. But because it's overkill, it's going to be a lot easier to get it to do what you want. Yeah, I mean, it's basically a little computer. Yeah, it's yeah. it is. 
uh, the laptop I had in college, and it's thirty five dollars. Yeah, that's that's pretty bonkers. So yes, the Raspberry Pi. I um, am looking to starting uh, start getting into more Arduino type stuff. I'm gonna rope my brother in here once he's got uh, a little time away from his kid uh, to start working on some of that stuff. Uh, the what you would call it? X Carve has a little Arduino in there. Yeah, yeah, it's got an Arduino Uno. Um, I fried mine, so yeah. mine has a replacement Uno in it. Um, like I said, the the amperage thing with the vacuum eventually uh, kept spiking the power supply and it fried the Uno that was in there. So don't do that. Run your vacuum off a different power supply. Yes, and uh, in the instructions too, it says you know check and double check all of your power connectors when you're hooking everything up. Otherwise, you will fry that sucker right away. Yep. So I already did that. I actually fried three Arduinos in one day. That was a that was a bad day. Uh, different different projects. Yeah, different projects. I uh, I was working on actually transistor stuff, and I was testing out some of the uh, the Adafruit. Um, by the way, everybody, Adafruit sponsored that project. They were really awesome. So if you need any electronic stuff, specifically Raspberry Pi, Arduino, or their really cool little uh, NeoPixels, the RGB pro programmable ones, uh, go to Adafruit, please, because they're awesome. Um, so Adafruit sent me some uh, NeoPixels to try out and some some um, uh, Arduinos. And uh, I hooked up my power supply, which is back around the bench behind me. And I, I was flip-flopping between two different projects I was working on, uh, the Amiga arm for the guys at 3D Realms and then the transistor for Supergiant Games. And the transistor operates at 5 volts and Amiga operates at 12. And I just kept going back and forth and back and forth. And one time I plugged up the Arduino guts and I fed it 12 volts and it just went <laughs> So, oh. and then I, I took that Arduino out. And I'm like, God, I can't believe I did that. Soldered up header pins to a new one, put the new one in. And I'm like, all right, click, boom, immediately. I didn't bother to check the voltage or anything. Just tried the second one right on top of it. So I went, son of a. Yeah. yeah. As, and then I had to find the one Radio Shack in town that still had an Uno in stock so I could beta test the, the, the code that I had. So that was a, that was a crap day. <laughs> Uh, this one just popped up from Fuzro Dave. Uh, he wants to know if you guys name your tools, and if so, what are they? Uh, and I do, and I need a name for that X Carve. I got to come up with something. Mine is named Carvis. Carvis, that's great. Carvis. Uh, my laser cutter is named Linus because he cuts lines. He does. That's right. Actually, I still haven't named name my laser cutter. My laser cutter, which by the way is back at full spectrum right now, getting looked at because I couldn't fix it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I can go down the list. So the laser cutter's name is Linus. My vacuum former is Mega Maid. Um, my uh, compressor is Booker Dewalt. Um, my uh, welder is named Hobart. My uh, spray booth is named Bender. Um, my ro roto casting machine is called Robo Bear. Klaus is my milling machine. Uh, my scroll saw is Adam. Uh, my disc sander is uh, Scruffy. Um, Sorry, my belt sander is scruffy. Uh, oh. My disc sander is disco stick. Um, right, my drill press is named wrong way because the RPM counter only works when it's in reverse. Uh, my lathe is called the Terminator. Uh, my bandsaw is called Foxy Tan, and my big lathe over there is named Sheldon. Very nice. I need more names for all my stuff. I only have uh, what is it? Oh, my my drill press is called the Bungholer. <laughs> That's good. And like the that. the oscillating spindle sander is called the spinatrator. Oh, <laughs> something deeply wrong about that name. I don't know. Like, speaking of, as an aside, how do you like that thing? I've always wanted to get one. The spindle sander is awesome. I love yeah. that thing. Yeah, it's great. Like if I got to clean up the inside of this thing here, where's my camera? Just drop it on there. And go. What? Done. Yep. Uh, and then my I have a. Uh, Big green bandsaw that I call Jabba the Cut. Yeah, Jabba the Cut is a good name. It's a good one. I have Thank a bunch you. of random like hand tools that are named. Um, not all of them, but some. Like I've got a uh, I've got a, a four and a half foot long breaker bar named Bertha, um, and I've got a uh, my grandfather's Craftsman drill uh, that was made in like 1912 or 1919 or something like that. It's named Sparky because the brushes have never been replaced. Whenever you turn it on, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. It's very terrifying, actually. Great. This is basically what happens when you work alone in your shop for like years. You're friends. 
All right, another one here. Oh, that was from Fuzero Dave. This one's from Lee. On a typical foam, uh, EVA foam armor build, how much time should I allow for painting, sealing, and strapping? I know it varies based on size and everything, but I'm looking for a general or average number. I'm behind schedule, and I want to make sure I have enough time for that part <laughs> of the costume. <laughs> Lee, you're you're screwed. Behind <laughs> schedule? On a costume? No way. Uh, yeah, that's really, without knowing the costume, it's hard to tell. Because if you have to do, if, if it's all one flat color, like Brittany's uh, Vex costume, most of the paint on that is black and bronze. So she did a base coat of bronze on the whole thing, masked off a couple areas, did the black, did some weathering, good to go. Uh, Shax has three colors, three or four colors. That was a, that took me three or four days. Uh, if you have anything that requires a lot of masking, you have to wait for the paint to dry before you can mask it, and that's going to increase your time. So just kind of, I don't know, you kind of got to eyeball it or start start making, a, what's the word? Start making compromises now. Use less. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, I like that. Start making compromises now. Yes. <laughs> That's what I and I, I do that too. So when I'm working on a costume project and I need to get it done, let's say in two weeks, I take my calendar on the last day I, it needs to be done, which is usually two days before a convention, so I have time for it to dry and everything. I uh, say done on my calendar, and then I work backwards from there, and I say if that's when it needs to be done, this is when I need to be painting because I know it may take three or four days to paint, and I go backwards until the current day. And then I can start figuring that out so that two or three days into the build, if I'm behind schedule, I know then. And I know that I yeah. need to start making compromises that's, if I have a prayer of getting it done. That's what I really like about this when I'm uh, painting. Obviously, you can't do this with foam, but um, you know the acrylic and the polyester primer, HVLP, or two-part urethanes, like you paint primer, 40 minutes later, it's dry and it's cured. You can sand it. And then you do base coat, one hour later, it's ready for clear. So, or you can you can do airbrush weathering, and then you know it's ready for clear immediately. So I can go from a, a raw part to primed, base coated, clear coated in a day. Yeah. Um, and back when in the ye old rattle can days, you know, that's a three and four day thing. So uh, switching over to HLP, really expensive, totally worth it. Yes. There you go, Lee. Good luck. Let me know next week how it how it turns out. <laughs> Um, here we go. This is cool. This one's from Neil. He wants to know how to do the glowing effect for visors and helmets like you see in most sci-fi gadgets. Uh, I, I'm going to guess something like a, like a Mass Effect visor where they've got like digital readouts and everything. Yeah, the etching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, either either having a laser cutter, which would be very nice, um, so you can, you can etch into a panel. Um, but if you've got something with a compound curve to it, so that's uh, for instance, a dome instead of like a you know a visor. Um, that's a little bit more difficult to etch into something like that. Uh, so I found that um, cutting translucent vinyl, you can actually get a sign shop to do that for you, which I did with the transistor. And you can run that down there, and when edge lit, that will catch more light than all the clear stuff. Um, so translucent vinyl is really great for that kind of thing. So it's just like a clear matte kind of looking vinyl. Yeah, it's um, well. I've got a I've got a scrap over there if you want to see it. Um, but it's um, it basically looks kind of silvery. But when you peel it off, it's it's translucent, so you can see light through, but you can't see perfectly through it. So it's got little flecks of metallic in it that catch more light that come through. Yeah. So yeah, so you could wow, the way to go. you could put that on your visor and then edge light it with some LEDs, and it'll look yep. really neat. Cool, Neil. There's some things for you to try. Let's see. This next one comes from Jay Cosplay. And he wants to know, he's in the process of building a new workshop and he's wondering if there's anything either of us would recommend uh, I could fit or install now uh, that you would include if you were building yours from scratch. So if you were, we actually, I think talked about this a bit when, when I was down there. So if you had a completely empty space and you could fit anything in there before all of your crap showed up, <laughs> what would you add? Yeah, uh, drop lines for power for sure. Because back there on those benches, I've got um, retracting cables that, that ratchet out, and they have a they have a power line in them. But there's nothing on my tables, so whenever I run power up to the tables, I have a cord going across the floor, which is a pain. What I would have liked to have done is to go up the wall, across, down to the drop ceiling, and have a ratcheting cord 
up there. I can still do that, I just don't have the time. Um, so easily accessible power. And then if you use air tools as often as I do, easily accessible air. I would love to have an airdrop line like right here in the middle of the room because my compressor is way over there in the corner, which is good for my spray booth, but bad for anything over here. Um, so if I need to like dust off my CNC or dust out the laser cutter or basically drag it over there, I have to unreal the entire hose. Um, and then there's a hose snaking across the ground that you can trip on. So um, ceiling mounted air and electricity, totally. Um, also your friend Mark, the wood whisperer has like the most gorgeous dust collection system I've ever seen. Yes. And you know, you've got the, the lines running everywhere, blast gates and stuff like that. Mine's hacked together. You might be able to see it down there. Each one of my tools has dust collection on them, but it's really hokey. Um, so what I'd like to have is one of those big, tall dust collectors way off in a corner and a bunch of routed, you know, pipes and stuff everywhere to, to get nice, um, large volume dust collection. Yes, I definitely would too. I have a big dust collector right there, but it only really has the two hoses running off of it. And then it's split over there and it's it's hacked together. It's really, yeah. really kind of janky. Uh, the other thing I would do uh, for my, this is specific to my needs, but I would have more consistent lighting. My seal, wow. like I'm touching the ceiling right now. It's really, really low, low ceilings wow. here. Um, I would love to have higher ceilings. I would have more consistent lighting for shooting video. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, a floor that I could roll a tripod around, uh, not this, this floor, like half of, this house was built in the 1920s. And uh, the, if you look at the walls, the creepy wall over there, you know it's that old. This floor right here is all not even, and that must have been poured later because it's smoother. It'd be great <laughs> if it was all smooth and I could roll a tripod around for shooting video. Well, I have a lot of space here, uh, and I, I did start a lot of this from scratch, so that's nice. I was actually able to rewire a fair bit, so I've got, I put in two 220 lines on that wall to run my mill and lathe with, and I put in a transformer over here on this wall for my vacuum forming machine. So I was able to set that up. Um, I was able to cut holes in the ceiling for ventilation for my laser cutter and my spray booth, which are both really nice. But. Um, yeah, that having having a little bit more time to route uh, to uh, really plot things out. Like when I was first moving in here, Emily and I sat down. We we built out my place in Google SketchUp. We're like, everything's going to go in these places, and it's going to be great. And it did not end up that way. No. I have this weird sort of mismatch of shelving right now. So like over there in that corner, which I can show you because I don't have any NDA stuff over there. So that direction, that's where I keep all of uh, my molds. Uh, my master sculpts, and then random shipping and receiving stuff, and all of my hardware. So screws, nuts, bolts, molds, they're all in that area. But for some reason, I decided it would be a really good idea to put all of my random like materials and stuff here. So that's like Sintra and Styrene and um, you know uh, ABS and electronic and wire and random plastic. So that's all there. And then like down underneath here on that one, I've got tooling board on one side and wooden stuff on the other. And then over on that one, I'm going to point that at the ground so nobody sees what's on the table. Over on that one, I've got like metal pipes and more wood and Sintra. And then I can't show you the one further that direction, but it's all my like uh, PVC pipe. And um, what the hell else do I have over there? I've got, oh, uh, more tooling foam. And you know, it would have been nice to have a little bit more centralized and planned out uh, idea of where shit goes. Uh, but this was all kind of bootstrapped. So it was, yeah. I moved in here and then I'm like, oh, I need another shelf. I guess I'll put it uh, there. And I need another shelf, so it'll go there. And what I wish I would have done is made really big, like custom, you know, take four, four by fours and make two foot by four foot really tall shelves to go all the way to the ceiling and build out way more storage than I needed. So I could grow into that instead of just kind of keep, you know, adding a shelf wherever the hell I can cram one. Yeah, I feel like, um, like if I if I wanted to, like, because we're, we're looking into buying a house and moving into a new space soon, and I have these lofty dreams of turning it into the perfect shop space. But I knew as as soon as I get there, I'm gonna be like, well, I need to make something tomorrow. So yeah. uh, just put that wherever, and we'll get working. I feel yeah. like I would need six solid months of nothing but building out a shop to make this dream space. I had I had like two weeks downtime. Yeah, 
uh, to pack and move. And I, I still had orders coming in. This was actually back when I sold a lot more kits than I do now. And I was midway between, I was midway into my, uh, my Planet Express ship project. And so I was just I, like, I was like, well, I need to like do this and do that. So the very first thing I like move over here and get the resin set up, right? You know, get the workbench, get my resin. And then uh, and, like, so I can slosh cast these things. And uh, it was this, like I would come in and I would work on setting up half of the shop for half of the day. And then the rest of the day I'd be building stuff. So I never got the time to sit down. Oh, um, that's the other thing I would like. A wall that's nothing but pegboard. Like, <laughs> like just because I ran out of pegboard. I bought these steel. By the way, if anybody thinks that buying steel pegboard is cooler or more interesting, it's crap. Okay? Don't do that. Just buy the wooden stuff. Because I bought all these. I'm going to show you guys because I'm. it's my folly. You can learn from me. So up there, it's all my steel pegboard, right, with all of my clamps and stuff like that. But the problem is whenever you pull something off, these are so, like, loose like the holes and stuff, that when you try and pull it, that happens every freaking time. So uh, steel pegboard is crap. Just buy the wooden stuff. Uh, don't do what I did. There you go. <laughs> Advice from a professional, everybody. Yeah, don't do what I did. That's that's kind of my mantra, actually, yeah. <laughs> so far as making props is concerned. Uh, cool. Thank you for the question. Uh, I forgot who said that one. That was from uh, Jay Cosplay. Let's. We are at the six o'clock mark. That went by real fast. Uh, let's grab one more question. This one's from my buddy Sanit, who is back down at Weta now after his whirlwind adventure through the United States, and uh, he's he wants to start doing some videos, and he has he's looking for advice. What should I start with? I think if you're going to go the Vulpen Props model, you just make a video of your portal gun that's 20 seconds long. Oh, fuck off. With no talking in it. Pissed stuff about that still. And in you in that one video will have more views. <laughs> Look, just because that has 6 million views, all right, it took me one take in 18 seconds to make, all right? You don't need to be salty about it, okay? No, no. Uh, I would say for shooting video, audio is more important than video. Getting a good, um, you can get a, a handheld recorder. Uh, I have just a little Tascam DR05. It's like a $100 audio recorder. Uh, I put a lavalier mic on it, but that's not necessary. So long as you get that thing near your face, record the audio with that and the video with anything else. You need, people will let poor video quality slide so long as they can understand what you're saying. Uh, so make sure your audio quality is pretty good. I'll link. We'll put a link in the description to the camera and uh, recorder that I use. Uh, make your intro less than three seconds. Yes. God's sake. <laughs> okay. Less than three second intro, and uh, don't hold on any one cut. Like if you're if you're doing a recap or something like that, don't hold on any one uh, thing for like more than ten seconds, or people are just gonna be bored. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a GoPro, I have an old GoPro Hero 2 that I like, and then I've got a Nikon D3100 that I shoot with in the shop sometimes. I do higher production stuff, okay? I don't only make crappy portal guns. <laughs> um, and actually, some of my other videos have done very well that I've spent a lot of time editing. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and then some of my videos that I spent a lot of time editing, no one gives a shit. So no. that's <laughs> That's always fun. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be way better than that 38 second portal gun crap. Nobody cares. No one cares. Uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. I I used to have an intro on my videos, and now my video, all my videos start with, "Hey, it's Bill. Look at what I did." Yeah, <laughs> I think people are more interested in the in the end of it anyway. I've got like nine videos in progress. All right, one of my one of them that is actually ready to publish, and I have no idea why I haven't put it up there, is a full walk through the holophoner. I'm like, hey, here's the holophone. Here's what it does. Here's how you put batteries in it. Isn't this cool? And I've never published it. And I, I have no idea why. <laughs> All right. Well, Santa, good luck. Uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you. Video ain't easy. But uh, the best thing to do is just start doing it. Then yeah, you learn. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, like, I think of it as kind of similar to the web comics model, right? Yeah. Consistent updates. Uh, and, and I don't follow a consistent update. <laughs> YouTube isn't my channel. You know, I don't. I don't spend a lot of time on YouTube. I just throw stuff up there for whenever. I don't care. It's not a thing I'm actively pursuing. Not like Bill, who actually pursues YouTube. So I'm the wrong person to answer this question. Um, 
But you know, you'll stop reading a webcomic if they go three, you know, if they miss three updates, you're like, oh, you know, school's really hard and I got a lot of family stuff. You stop paying attention. Um, but yeah, consistent quality, you know, interesting materials is the key to any social media. Really. <laughs> Consist consistency is definitely the key. I'm checking here. I'm just curious to see uh, how many views. <laughs> Ten thousand views for Louis troubleshooting the transistor. Yeah, That's pretty I good, thought Louis. that was. I, you know what? I think for for a little iPhone thing of of Louis barking at the transistor, not bad. Ten thousand, pretty good. Great um, job. Uh, that's about all the time we've got, everyone. There were a lot of questions. We didn't get to them all, but thank you, everyone, who threw them our way. Lots of really great questions. You guys are, you guys are great. Uh, Harrison, you have anything coming up that you can talk about? No? Uh, give me a second. Uh, so no on this one and no on that one. Um, the transistor, yes. No on the next one. 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 No. No, I don't. All right. <laughs> but Harrison is working on a new book, and he claims he'll have that worked on during uh, his break in November. So we all wait with bated breath to see how that comes out. Uh, but until then, everyone, VulpenProps.com, VulpenProps on Facebook, VulpenProps on Twitter, all of those things. And and I believe oh, Instagram, too. On, on YouTube, it's just Vulpen. Oh, there you go. Because I got to that before that guy whose last name is Vulpen got to it. There you go. Uh, anyway, thank you everyone for showing up. We'll do this again next week. So long, everybody. So long, everybody. <laughs>